After practice one afternoon, Ender stayed in the battle room. He had noticed that Dink Meeker usually came late to dinner, and he assumed it was for extra practice. Ender wasn't very hungry, and he wanted to see what it was Dink practiced when no one could see him. But Dink didn't practice. He stood near the door, watching Ender. Ender stood across the room, watching Dink. Neither spoke. It was plain Dink expected Ender to leave. It was just as plain that Ender was saying no. Dink turned his back on Ender, methodically took off his flash suit, and gently pushed off from the floor. He drifted slowly toward the center of the room, very slowly, his body relaxing almost completely so that his hands and arms seemed to be caught by almost non-existent air currents in the room. After the speed and tension of practice, the exhaustion, the alertness, it was restful just to watch him drift. He did it for ten minutes or so before he reached another wall. Then he pushed off rather sharply, returned to his flash suit, and pulled it on. Come on, he said to Ender. They went to the barracks. The room was empty since all the boys were at dinner. Each went to his own bunk and changed into regular uniforms. Ender walked to Dink's bunk and waited for a moment till Dink was ready to go. Why did you wait? asked Dink. Wasn't hungry. Well, now you know why I'm not a commander. Ender had wondered. Actually, they promoted me twice, and I refused. Refused? The second time, they took away my old locker and bunk and desk, assigned me to a commander's cabin, and gave me an army. But I just stayed in the cabin until they gave in and put me back into somebody else's army. Why? Because I won't let them do it to me. I can't believe you haven't seen through all this crap yet, Ender, but I guess you're young. These other armies, they aren't the enemy. It's the teachers. They're the enemy. They get us to fight each other, to hate each other. The game is everything. Win, win, win. It amounts to nothing. We kill ourselves, go crazy trying to beat each other, and all the time the old bastards are watching us, studying us, discovering our weak points, deciding whether we're good enough or not. Well, good enough for what? I was six years old when they brought me here. What the hell did I know? They decided I was right for the program, but nobody ever asked me if the program was right for me. So, why don't you go home? Dink smiled crookedly. Because I can't give up the game. He tugged at the fabric of his flash suit, which lay on the bunk beside him. Because I love this. So why not be a commander? Dink shook his head. Never. Look what it does to Rosin. The boy's crazy. Rose de nose. Sleeps in here with us instead of in his cabin. Why? Because he's scared to be alone and her. Scared of the dark. Rose? But they made him a commander, and so he has to act like one. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's winning, but that scares him worst of all because he doesn't even know why he's winning except that I have something to do with it. Any minute, somebody could find out that Rosin isn't some magic Israeli general who can win no matter what. He doesn't know why anybody wins or loses. Nobody does. It doesn't mean he's crazy, Dink. I know you've been here a year. You think these people are normal. Well, they're not. We're not. I look in the library. I call up books on my my desk, old ones, because they won't let us have anything new. But I've got a pretty good idea what children are, and we are not children. Children can lose sometimes, and nobody cares. Children aren't in armies. They aren't commanders. They don't rule over 40 other kids. It's more than anybody can take and not get crazy. Ender tried to remember what other children were like in his class at school back in the city, but all he could think of was Stilson. I had a brother, just a normal guy. All he cared about was girls and flying. He wanted to fly. He used to play ball with the guys, a pickup game, shooting hoops at a, balls at a hoop, dribbling down the corridors until the peace officers confiscated your ball. We had a great time. He was teaching me how to dribble when I was taken. Ender remembered his own brother, and the memory was not fond. Dink misunderstood the expression on Ender's face. Hey, I know nobody's supposed to talk about home, but we came from somewhere. The battle school didn't create us, you know? The battle school doesn't create anything. It just destroys. And we all remember things from home. Maybe not good things, but we remember, and when we lie and pretend that... Look, Ender, why is it that nobody talks about home ever? Doesn't that tell you how important it is? That nobody even admits that? Oh, hell. No, it's all right, Ender said. I was just thinking about Valentine. My sister. I wasn't trying to make you upset. It's okay. I don't think of her very much because I always get... Like this. That's right. We never cry. 
I never thought of that. Nobody ever cries. We really are trying to be adults, just like our fathers. I bet your father was like you. I bet he was quiet and took it, and then busted out, and I'm not like my father. So maybe I'm wrong, but look at Bonzo, your old commander. He's got an advanced case of Spanish honor. He can't allow himself to have weaknesses. To be better than him, that's an insult. To be stronger, that's like cutting off his balls. That's why he hates you. Because you didn't suffer when he tried to punish you. He hates you for that. He honestly wants to kill you. He's crazy. They're all crazy. And you aren't? I'd be crazy too, little buddy. But at least when I'd be the craziest, I'd be floating all along in space. And the crazy, she float out of me. She soak into the walls. And she don't come out till there be battles. And little boys bump into the walls and squish out to crazy. And her smiles. And you'd be crazy too, said Dink. Come on. Let's go eat. Maybe you can be a commander and not be crazy. Maybe knowing about craziness means you don't have to fall for it. I'm not going to let the bastards run me, Ender. They got you pegged too, and they don't plan to treat you kindly. Look what they've done to you so far. They haven't done anything except promote me. And she make you laugh so easy, nay? Ender laughed and shook his head. So maybe you're right. They think they got, they got you on ice. Don't let them. But that's what I came for. Ender said, for them to make me into a tool, to save the world. I can't believe you still believe it. Believe what? The bugger menace. Save the world. Listen, Ender, if the buggers were coming back to get us, they'd be here. They aren't invading again. We beat them and they're gone. But the videos. All from the first and second invasions. Your grandparents weren't born yet when Mazer Rackham wiped them out. You watch. It's all a fake. There is no war. And they're just screwing around with us. But why? Because as long as people are afraid of the buggers, the IF can stay in power. And as long as the IF is in power, certain countries can keep their hegemony. But keep watching the vids, Ender. People will catch on to this game pretty soon, and there will be a civil war to end all wars. That's the menace, Ender, not the buggers. And in that war, when it comes, you and I won't be friends. Because you're American, just like our dear teachers. And I am not. They went to the mess hall and ate, talking about other things, but Ender could not stop thinking about what Dirk had said. The battle school was so enclosed, the game so important in the minds of the children that Ender had forgotten there was a world outside Spanish honor. Civil war. Politics. The battle school was really a very small place, wasn't it? But Ender did not reach Dink's conclusions. The buggers were real. The threat was real. The IF controlled a lot of things, but it didn't control the videos and the nets. Not where Ender had grown up. In Dink's home in the Netherlands, with three generations under Russian hegemony, perhaps it was all controlled. But Ender knew that lies would not last long in America. So he believed. Believed, but the seed of doubt was there, and it stayed, and every now and then sent out a little root. It changed everything. To have that seed growing. It made Ender listen more carefully to what people meant instead of what they said. It made him wise. There weren't as many boys at the evening practice, not by half. Where's Bernard? asked Ender. Alay grinned. Shen closed his eyes and assumed a look of blissful meditation. Haven't you heard? said another boy, a launchie from a younger group. Words out that any launchie who comes to your practice sessions will ever amount to anything in anybody's army. Words out that the commanders don't want any soldiers who've been damaged by your training. Ender nodded. But the way I brain it, said the launchie, I'll be the best soldier I can. And an, any commander with a damn, he'd take me, nay? Eh, said Ender with finality. They went on with practice, about half an hour into it, when they were practicing throwing off collisions with, uh, with frozen soldiers, several commanders in different uniforms came in. They ostentatiously took down names. Hey, shouted Alay, make sure you spell my name right. The next night, there were even fewer boys. Now Ender was hearing the stories, little launchies getting slapped around in the bathrooms or having accidents in the mess hall and the game room, or getting their files trashed by older boys who had broken the primitive security system that guarded the launchies' desks. No practice tonight, Ender said. The hell there's not, said Alay. Give it a few days. I don't want any of the little kids getting hurt. If you stop even one night, they'll figure it works to do this kind of thing, just like if you'd ever 
backed down to Bernard, back when he was being a swine. Besides, said Shen, we aren't scared and we don't care, so you owe it to us to go on. We need the practice and so do you. Ender remembered what Dink had said. The game was trivial compared to the whole world. Why should anybody give every night of his life to this stupid, stupid game? We don't accomplish that much anyway, Ender said. He started to leave. Alay stopped him. They scare you too? They slap you up in the bathroom? Stick your head in the pissa? Somebody's got a gun up your bung? No, Ender said. You still my friend? Asked Alay more quietly. Yes. Then I still your friend, Ender, and I stay here and practice with you. The older boys came again, but fewer of them were commanders. Most were members of a couple of armies. Ender recognized salamander uniforms, even a couple of rats. They didn't take names this time. Instead, they mocked and shouted and ridiculed as the launchies tried to master difficult skills with untrained muscles. It began to get a few of the boys. Listen to them. Ender said to the other boys, remember the words. If you ever want to make your enemy crazy, shout that kind of stuff at them. It makes them do dumb things, to be mad. But we don't get mad. Shen took the idea to heart, and after each jive from the older boys, he had a group of four launchies recite the words, loudly, five or six times. When they started singing the taunts like nursery rhymes, some of the older boys launched themselves from the wall and came out for a fight. The flash suits were designed for wars fought with harmless light. They offered little protection and seriously hampered movement if it came to hand-to-hand -to -hand fighting in Nolo. Half the boys were flashed anyway and couldn't fight, but the stiffness of their suits made them potentially useful. Ender quickly ordered his launchies to gather in one corner of the room. The older boys laughed at them even more, and some who had waited by the wall came forward to join in the attack, seeing Ender's group in retreat. Ender and Alay decided to throw a frozen soldier in the face of an enemy. The frozen launchy struck helmet first, and the two caromed off of each other. The older boy clutched his chest where the helmet had hit him and screamed in pain. The mockery was over. The rest of the older boys launched themselves to enter the battle. Ender didn't really have much hope of any of the boys getting away without much some injury, but the enemy was coming haphazardly, uncoordinatedly. They had never worked together before, while Ender's little practice army, though there were only a dozen of them now, knew each other well and knew how to work together. Go Nova! shouted Ender. The boys laughed. They gathered into three groups, feet together, squatting, holding hands so they formed small stars against the back wall. We'll go around them and make for the door. Now! At his signal, the three stars burst apart, each boy launching in a different direction, but angled so he could rebound off a wall and head for the door. Since all of the enemy were in the middle of the room, where course changes were far more difficult, it was an easy maneuver to carry out. Ender positioned himself so that when he launched, he would rendezvous with a frozen soldier he had just used as a missile. The boy wasn't frozen now, and he let Ender catch him, whirl him around, and send him toward the door. Unfortunately, the necessary result of the action was for Ender to head in the opposite direction and at a reduced speed. None alone of all his soldiers, he was drifting fairly slowly and at the end of the battle room where the other boys were gathering. He shifted himself so he could see that all his soldiers were safely gathered at the far wall. In the meantime, the furious and disorganized army had just spotted him. Ender calculated how soon he could reach the wall so he could launch again. Not soon enough. Several enemies had already rebounded toward him. Ender was startled to see Stilson's face among them. Then he shuddered and realized he'd been wrong. Still, it was the same situation, and this time they wouldn't sit still for a single combat settlement. There was no leader, as far as Ender knew, and these boys were a lot bigger than him. <clears throat> <clears throat> Still, he had learned some things about weight shifting in personal combat classes and about the physics of moving objects. Game battles almost never got to hand-to-hand -hand combat. You never bumped into an enemy that wasn't frozen unless you were frozen yourself. So in the few seconds he had, Ender tried to position himself to receive his guests. Fortunately, they knew as little about Nolo fighting as he did, and the few who tried to punch him found that throwing a punch was pretty ineffective when their bodies moved backward just as quickly as their fists moved forward. But there were some in the group who had bone breaking on their minds, and Ender quickly saw. He didn't plan to be there for it, though. He caught one of the punchers by the arm and threw him as hard as he could. It hurled Ender out of the way of the rest of the first onslaught, though. He still wasn't getting any closer to the door. 
Stay there, he shouted at his friends, who obviously were forming up to come and rescue him. Just stay there. Someone caught Ender by the foot. The tight grip gave Ender some leverage. <clears throat> he was about to stamp firmly on the boy's ear and shoulder, making him cry out and let go. If the boy had let go, just as Ender kicked downward, it would have hurt him much less, and followed allowed Ender to use the maneuver as a launch. Instead, the boy had hung on too well. His ear was torn and scattering blood in the air. Ender was drifting even more slowly. I'm doing it again, thought Ender. I'm hurting people again just to save myself. Why don't they leave me alone so I don't have to hurt them? Three more boys were converging on him now, and this time they were acting together. Still, they had to grab him before he could hurt, they could hurt him. Hender positioned himself quickly so that two of them would take his feet, leaving his hands free to deal with the third. Sure enough, they took the bait. Ender grasped the shoulders of the soldier, shoulders of the third boy's shirt and pulled him up sharply, butting him in the face with his helmet. Again, a scream and a shower of blood. The two boys who held his legs were wrenching at them, twisting him. Ender threw the boy with the bleeding nose at one of them. They entangled and Ender's feet came free. It was a simple matter then to use the other boy's hold for leverage to kick him firmly in the groin, then shove him off in the direction of the door. He didn't get that good a launch, so that his speed was nothing special, but it didn't matter. No one was following him. He got to his friends at the door. They caught him and handed him along to the door. They were laughing and slapping him playfully. You bad, he said. You scary, you flame. Practice is over for the day. Ender said, they'll be back tomorrow, said Shen. Won't do them any good, said Ender. If they come without suits, we'll do this again. If they come with suits, we can flash them. Besides, said Alay, the teachers won't let it happen. Ender remembered what Dink had told him and wondered if Alay was right. Hey, Ender, shouted one of the older boys as Ender left the battle room. You nothing, man. You be nothing. My old commander, Bonso, said Ender. I think he doesn't like me. Ender checked the rosters on his desk that night. Four boys turned up on medical reports, one with bruised ribs, one with a bruised testicle, one with a torn ear, and one with a broken nose and a loose tooth. The cause of injury was the same in all cases. Accidental collision in Null G. If the teachers were allowing that to turn up on the official report, it was obvious they didn't intend to punish anyone for the nasty little skirmish in the battle room. Aren't they going to do anything? Don't they care what goes on in this school? Since he was back to the barracks earlier than usual, Ender called up the fantasy game on his desk. It had been a while since he had last used it, long enough that it didn't start him where he had left off. Instead, he began by the giant's corpse. Only now, it was hardly identifiable as a corpse at all, unless you stood off a ways and studied it. The body had eroded into a hill entwined with grass and vines. Only the crest of the giant's face was still visible, and it was white bone, like limestone protruding from a discouraged, withering mountain. Ender did not look forward to fighting with the wolf children again, but to his surprise, they weren't there. Perhaps killed once, they were gone forever. It made him a little sad. He made his way underground through the tunnels to the cliff ledge overlooking the beautiful forest. Again, he threw himself down, and again a cloud caught him and carried him into the castle turret room. The snake began to unweave itself from the rug again, only this time Ender did not hesitate. He stepped on the head of the snake and crushed it under his foot. It writhed and twisted under him, and in response he twisted and ground it deeper into the stone floor. Finally, it was still. Ender picked it up and shook it until it unwove itself and the pattern in the rug was gone. Then, still dragging the snake behind him, he began to look for a way out. Instead, he found a mirror. And in the mirror, he saw a face that he easily recognized. It was Peter, with blood dripping down his chin and a snake's tail protruding from a corner of his mouth. Ender shouted and thrust his desk from him. The few boys in the barracks were alarmed at the noise, but he apologized and told them it was nothing. They went away. He looked again, into his desk. His figure was still there, staring into the mirror. He tried to pick up some of the furniture to break the mirror, but it would not be moved. The mirror would not come off the wall either. Finally, Ender threw the snake at it. The mirror shattered, leaving a hole in the wall behind it. Out of the hole came dozens of tiny snakes, each quickly bit 
Ender's fingers again and again, tearing the snakes frantically from itself, the figure collapsed and died in a writhing heap of small serpents. The screen went blank, and words appeared. Play again? Ender signed off and put the desk away. The next day, several commanders came to Ender or sent soldiers to tell him not to worry. Most of them thought the extra practice sessions were a good idea. He should keep it up. And to make sure nobody bothered him, they were sending a few of the older soldiers who needed extra practice to come join him. They're as big as most of the buggers you attacked last night. They'll think twice. Instead of a dozen boys, there were 45 that night, more than any army, and whether it was because of the presence of older boys on Ender's side or because they had had enough the night before, none of their enemies came. Ender didn't go back to the fantasy game, but it lived in his dreams. He kept remembering how it felt to kill the snake, grinding it in, the way he tore the ear off that boy, the way he destroyed Stilson, the way he broke Bernard's arm. And then, to stand up, holding the corpse of his enemy, and find Peter's face looking out at him from the mirror. This game knows too much about me. This game tells filthy lies. I am not Peter. I don't have murder in my heart. And then a worse fear that he was a killer, only better at it than Peter ever was, that it was this very trait that pleased the teachers. It's killers they need for the bugger wars. It's people who can grind the enemy's face into the dust and spatter their blood all over space. Well, I'm your man. I'm the bloody bastard you wanted when you had me spawned. I'm your tool, and what difference does it make if I hate the part of me that you most need? What difference does it make that when the little serpents killed me in the game, I agreed with them and was glad. <laughs>